sRGB, Adobe RGB, Profoto, LAB, 8-bit, 16-bit. Today we're talking about colors. Hey everyone, Stefan here. I hope you're doing well. The idea was to create an episode about color grading, but then I realized some of my students, they're still very much confused about color itself. Color profiles, gamuts about sRGB versus Profoto, 8-bit versus 16-bit, and in general, how we actually perceive color. So I thought, Today, let's clear up a few of those theoretical things so that when we jump in next week, we're all on the same page. Now, when it comes to perceiving color, there's various figures out there, and I find that quite weird. Usually, you have a pretty exact measurement, but here, most medical journals, they say the human can see colors somewhere between two and up to 10 million different colors. That seems a weird number. Two to 10, that's five times more. So some people must see very few colors and others, I don't know how you measure that. But anyway, we see colors in that range. To be honest, it's actually a very small range in the electromagnetic spectrum, and it has all to do with wavelengths. So a very short wavelength would be violet, very longish, I believe it's red, and then all the other colors are sandwiched in between. Now, how do we actually see it? Well, yes, with our eyes, but most of the lifting actually happens in the visual cortex. We hear the term colorblind. Now, that's a term that is wrong, even though there's about 5% in the world who are colorblind, but they're really color deficient. That means that they don't see certain colors. It doesn't mean that they completely see everything monochromatic. Now, if you're a woman, well, you're lucky. It's only about one in 200 who have such a deficiency. For men, it's a little bit less lucky. It's one in 12, I believe. So if you have 11 friends who see perfect color, it might be you. Anyway, there's even glasses to correct this. It works for some, it doesn't work for others. But anyway, that's going too far. Now, what does the eye actually see and what does the visual cortex do? Well, the visual cortex is really the computer, the brain that runs it all. If we look at our eye, this is what we usually see. But let's take the beauty away, the eyelashes and the eyelids, and what we get is the eyeball. And at the back of the eyeball is the retina. In the retina, we have two types of sensors, if you want to call it, the cones, and the rods. Now, the rods are there to pick up difference in light intensity, so black and white. The cones, it's, however, they're sensitive to certain wavelengths, like I mentioned. So, longer wavelengths, like the red parts, or shorter wavelengths. And depending on which wavelength come into the eye and are focused on the retina, one or the other or all three of the cones, they send signal and measure how much of that wavelength has touched the retina and therefore sending that information back to the visual cortex, which now takes those three values, the amount of red, the amount of green and the amount of blue and calculates the color that we then think that we see. So. When we go to the computer and we look at RGB, that actually makes a lot of sense because that's exactly the cones that we have, those that react to the reds, to the blues, and to the greens. So looking at the spectrum that our eyes can perceive, how do we now make sure that when we look at photos, as example, on different devices, it looks the same everywhere? Well, we sort of have to limit it to a common denominator. And that common denominator is S. RGB. sRGB is the format or the color gamut that we should use for web, for social media. It works on the phone, on your tablet, on the computer, and it's a small subset of all the colors that we can see. A slightly larger color gamut covering a larger area is Adobe RGB, and even larger is Pro Photo. 
Now on your camera, you're probably seeing that there is a setting where you can pick the color profile, be it sRGB or Adobe RGB. As a little side note, that only matters if you shoot in JPEG. I mentioned that in previous episodes, where you should always shoot in RAW. In RAW, that doesn't matter because you're recording the actual sensor data and you make that decision afterwards on the computer. But if you shoot JPEG, well, switch it to Adobe RGB so that you have the chance to cover a larger area of colors. Which brings us to how RGB actually produces all those different colors. I mentioned at the beginning that in our brain, well, the visual cortex does that for us. So how does that work on a computer? Well, with those three colors, we can pretty much produce most colors that are out there. Well, at least theoretically. You can do this in Photoshop and you can try that in Photoshop yourself. Let's have a look. Recreating what we've just seen in Photoshop is actually super simple. All you need is a black canvas for right now. It doesn't matter what size. Select a color. Well, in Photoshop, the highest value is 255 per channel. We talked about red, green and blue. So if we want 100% red or as red as it gets, well, that would be a 255. So we say OK and we hold the shift key and just draw out a circle. Now we do this again. Here we go. And then we move them sort of apart. So now we go into our layers panel, we just double click it and change the color. So for the green one, we want zero red, but we want all the green we can get. And then for the blue channel, the same story. We don't no red and we want 255 in the blue channel. So now we have that and what happens when we now move that blue over? Well, nothing happens. It just covers it as you would expect. Let's just arrange them for a minute so that we actually see the effect. I select all of them. I'll make them a little bit bigger just so that they fill the screen nicely. Here we go. The trick here is the blending mode. Somehow they have to interact and Photoshop has to know in what way. Well, there is one setting that is called difference. And now you can select any of those layers and move them around. And as they intersect, you will see that there is a color change happening. And as all three intersect, you would assume that we get 100% of each of those colors. And that is white. The reason for this is RGB is an additive color mode. That means it adds to each other. CMYK, however, the one that we use for print works completely the opposite way. Just imagine on a computer screen, well, we start with nothing. It's black. So whatever we add to it will go brighter and brighter and brighter to the point where, as we have here in the intersection, we get white. If this would be a white canvas, however, we have to work in CMYK, which means that the more ink we put on the paper, the darker it gets. So how to get from this to print? It's so simple to illustrate. You just take the background, you hit Command I to invert it. And guess what? We get cyan, magenta and yellow, exactly what you would expect in print. And as they overlap, the more ink you put on top of each other, the darker it gets. Reality, however, is it's more of a darkish, yucky brown. And having three layers of ink on top of each other makes it a lot harder to dry, also very much depending on the paper. So that's why we have cyan, magenta, yellow and black to avoid exactly these issues. Which then brings me to bit depth. That might be the most confusing. 8-bit, 16-bit, what does that exactly mean? And then we hear those big numbers, 16.7 million colors or 211 trillion colors. How does that actually work? Let's focus on 8 
and 16-bit, since these are the two that you will come across when you work in Photoshop. What does it mean? It really means that we have eight bits of information for each of our color channels. So we have eight bits for red, eight bits for green, and eight bits for blue. The computer only talks in zeros and ones. So if we add up how many combinations there could be, we end up at 256 possible colors per channel. Doing our maths, the possible amount of 16.7 million different colors. 16-bit. Obviously, it means that we now have 16 different bits per channel, which means that we have 65,000 colors for each channel, or 281 trillion possible colors in 16-bit. Now, I personally always find it difficult to grasp the difference between big numbers. But to give you an idea what the difference really is, let's not think of it as colors, but in seconds. So 16.7 million seconds would be about 194 days. 281 trillion seconds, however, represents 8.9 million years. So that's about eight and a half million years before the first human sapiens actually worked this planet. So yeah, it's a slight difference. So why is that so important? Well, here is a very simple example. We have an 8-bit file and we have a 16-bit file. They look exactly the same because they are. It's just a simple gradient as you would see somewhere in the mid-afternoon sky. We have some blue tones. It goes into some gray, whitish tones and into some different blue tones. So what happens if we now quite heavily manipulate those colors in 8-bit. So I've created a little curves adjustment layer, as you can see, went a little crazy with the different color channels, and this is what we get. As you can see, there's already some banding showing up, because in 8-bit, we're just running out of possible tones. If I now duplicate this layer, it becomes even more obvious. So let's jump into our 16-bit channel and we apply the exact same curve. No banding whatsoever. We duplicate it, no banding still. Let's duplicate this again. It becomes an extreme color shift, but there is no banding whatsoever. Let's go back to the 8-bit image and do this again and you will now clearly see that the extra amount of colors makes a huge difference. So does that mean I have to retouch everything in 16-bit? No, you don't. Many pictures will be just fine in 8-bit. However, as soon as you do really heavy lifting, move it to 16-bit, do your manipulations, then flatten the image, bring it back to your 8-bit original file, and you will see that those gradients are much, much smoother. Is that it? No, there's one more, and that is LAB. Not lab, as some people call it, but LAB, which stands for lightness, and A, and the B channel. LAB is a totally different beast. Nevertheless, you actually already know how to use it. When you play around with your color balance, be it in camera or be it in Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, doesn't matter, you will have already seen what LAB actually does. While a picture in RGB is created based on the three color channels, so the amount of red, the amount of green, the amount of blue, in LAB, these channels will look a little bit different. We have a lightness channel and two color channels. The A channel, which deals with the color ranges between green and magenta, and the B channel, which deals with colors between blue and yellow. So if we would create a curves adjustment layer, we can now influence the lightness channel, the A channel, and the B channel. So if we make any changes in the B channel, what would you expect? You would expect a color shift towards blue or towards yellow. So as we move this up, we introduce a lot of yellow. And if we go down, we introduce a lot of blue. 
So while in RGB we have three colors, well here we're mixing it with four, green, magenta, blue and yellow. With the added bonus that we now also introduce a lightness channel. So why is that important? In RGB, if you are at the ends of the spectrum, be it at zero for black or 255 white, well, that's it. There is no way to add color into something that is already at 100%. So if we take this curve as example and move this down here, in these black areas, we will get zero, 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 as in absolutely no information whatsoever because RGB is already at its minimum. If we, however, have a lightness channel, well, we can be in the lightness channel at zero, but at the same time, we still have an A and a B channel where we could still introduce colors. So where does that come into play? Well, next week, when we look into color grading, we will do some grades in LAB as well in Photoshop. However, there's a much more important underlying problem that we have to solve. Every single unit that we use to represent or reproduce color uses a different profile. So let's say we have the camera and that image from the camera should be displayed on our screen correctly. Well, we have an input profile, which somehow has to be translated into the display profile. So those colors look the same. What happens under the hood really is that the profile from the camera is converted into LAB and then back from LAB into our display profile. And theoretically, it should display the same colors. Now, sometimes those profiles are slightly off and that's where calibration comes in. And the same applies to print. So the image that looks shiny, beautiful, colorful on our screen somehow has to be translated into what the printer can do. Now we're not only going from RGB to another RGB profile, but we're actually going from RGB to CMYK. And yet again, it needs to be converted and it's doing so through LAB. Of course, that all happens in the background, be it in Capture One, Lightroom, in Photoshop. All these work under the hood with LAB and just convert it to whatever it actually needs. Well, there you go. I hope that explained a few things. Now, next week, we will jump into Photoshop and do some heavy color grading and giving those photos a little bit of extra twist and colors and hopefully your personal style. Until then, stay safe. And if you like what I do, click the like button. Why not? Leave a nice comment, hit the subscribe button, including the bell, so you always get notifications. Most importantly, however, stay creative, stay safe, and I'll see you next Friday.